All righty, here we go. Welcome to the first episode of Freedom Fridays. I'm excited to start doing this with you guys. Excited to answer your questions. Um, I'll kind of give a quick version of what I gave in the, in the Empower Hour on Wednesday. And for those of you guys who have not, who were not there to see it live, you can always go into the archive version of that course and see that. So yeah, th the goal of this program is to help empower you guys, to help you learn um, everything you, you need to know to walk in full freedom. So that's to get free yourself as well as to help set others free, right? That's that's part of the call of being a follower of Jesus is to live the way that he lived. And he was a deliverer. He was a healer. And so um, I wanted to provide this forum to help people get the questions that they have answered uh, in a way that allows them to not only get the answers, but also we can all learn from it. We can all grow and we can get more out of our time. Okay. So um, I will prioritize those who uh, make an effort and are intentional about showing up. So I'm going to prioritize your questions if you're able to be a part of the live show. Um, I will have, sometimes I'll have a survey or a poll at the beginning of the show. So that way uh, you guys can tell me if you want to do a theme-based show where we focus on one theme and kind of dig into different aspects of that theme. And so that's one of the options, as well as you can always post your question in the chat. And I might, if I know you well enough, um, I might... Uh, give you the option to be unmuted to ask it over the air or even possibly in the future uh, let you be on video for the stream as well but uh, you know there's certainly you don't have to do that that's just something this system allows me to do and so it's an option in the future um, but yeah so I will prioritize the people who make an effort to show up and be a part of the shows who support it and um, but I also want to give the option, if you can't be at any of the live shows, you can leave a question in the live course. There's a, the ability to leave a question right there. And then there's a discussion area where you can leave follow-up questions. And um, it's kind of a new system, so I'm still trying to figure out the ins and the outs. But uh, I might have another option there in the future where it links off to another website or another tool that allows me to to capture everybody's questions. I don't want to miss any questions. I want to make sure I get them all and, um, you know, and prioritize them so that way I can be a blessing for all you guys um, in the body of Christ. So without further ado, let's jump in. I, I have one question uh, preloaded here. Let me get it pulled up. So this is from Sarah, and she asks this question. Um, certain people have very outward physical manifestations. And so what she's referring to is a demonic manifestation where the demons who are cohabiting a person or who are demonizing a person have the ability to physically manifest themselves and their presence in some way. And so um, this could be a manifestation could happen either in the mind or the thoughts, um, but it could also be a way where the demon presents themselves in a more obvious external way so it could be they come to the consciousness and they can uh, speak through a person or they start to look through the eyes of a person. And um, sometimes there also can be physical manifestations where they're actually able to move the body or cause problems within the body. And so um, she says, she asks the question, if people who have outward physical manifestations, if I've noticed if they tend to have a harder time getting completely free of their demons. And she, she gives a little follow-up. She says, I've been suspecting this for a while. Uh, she sends me a video um, on YouTube. 
and says um, they suspected that the person in the video had a spirit spouse. And uh, also at the end of that video, um, they didn't say that she was completely free after whatever uh, deliverance effort that they did, but said that she needed to continue to receive ministry. And so the question uh, continues. It seems like the Bible, the people in the Bible with the most outward physical manifestations had the hardest times getting free too. For example, the demoniac man at the tombs, the demons didn't leave the first time Jesus told them to go. And as well as the boy that would convulse and be thrown in the fire or water, which the disciples wondered why they couldn't cast out the demon. And so, um, so do the people who have outward physical manifestations have a harder time getting completely free of their demons? Well, hmm. let's consider this. Well, practically speaking, um, I don't think so. Um, a lot of times the greater stronghold that a demon can have in a person, right? And the stronghold is the place of embedment that a demon has in your life. And so like we, we sort of describe a legal right as kind of the way they get in. A stronghold, usually emotional, is kind of the way that they stay in. And so there is this there is this emotional embedment in a person's life usually the way that they're thinking certain beliefs or certain um, memories that continue to happen or um, areas of the emotional entanglement where there was deep depression about something or anxiety or fear or you know identity something deeply emotional that's usually the area of strongest entanglement because there's an aspect of the human free will that's involved, right? We have the, the as the will is sort of in this uh, state where it's very vulnerable and flexible and the Nemans know this and they're sort of capitalizing on this thing and they're gaining position and ground as a result of it they're they're either satisfying the need that um that was had by the host person they're either meeting that need in some way or they're attacking it and latching on to it in some way and so if it's physical um it, i don't think that that actually would be as um as invasive and as deeply interwoven into a person's soul, right? Our soul is our mind, our will, our emotions, our desires, the memories, all this, the aspects of who we are as a person. And so when they can get in there, it's deeply entrenched in who we are. But as just part of the body, right? If it's just a spirit of infirmity or some other um access to the body, um, I don't think that they would have a greater position of strength as a result of that, because the soul is actually more complex than the body. Um, the soul has a lot of like compartments and rooms and areas of dominion that are available to it. And so there's actually a lot more uh, um, vulnerability to hide and to, to try to to gain influence within the person's soul. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think, I mean, we, we do have these biblical examples um, where, let's see, we have these biblical examples. You have the demoniac man at the tombs. Um, they didn't leave the first time uh, Jesus told them to. Um did they not leave the first time? I know Jesus questioned them. Um, so let's see. 
we can actually take a look at this story. Um, okay, so this is in Mark five. Um, in the future, I might actually pull this up on the screen, but this is a pretty this is a pretty short um, thing I want to look at here. When they saw this is uh, Mark five verse six from the ESV I'm reading from, he says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And so the first thing I would point out is that even though the man was demonized, it, it wasn't the idea of the demons to run over to Jesus and be like, and, and uh, what they say, the next thing is crying out with a loud voice. What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. So it wasn't the demons who were like, oh, that's Jesus. That's the son of God. He came here to torment me. I'm going to run over to him. <laughs> so I, I, I think a good case could be made just using human reason that it was the, the human host, the, the will of that man who wanted, who sensed in him that there's something about Jesus that would bring freedom to him. He's the one who ran over to the person. Um, he's the one who it says he ran and fell down before him. The demons don't generally want to get on their knees and bow before God or God's people. And so I think it was the man, the physical aspect of the man who who ran and submitted. And then you have the the demons then starting to speak out at that point. Um, and it says, um, for he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And so, yeah, so I guess, so the question is, you know, was he, did Jesus to say, come out of him? Um, and then they said, what have you to do with me? So they're sort of resisting. Um, but now I, I think the other, I think the other case, the fact that they ran, the fact that the dude ran over to meet Jesus. Um, and if you actually look, there's another, a parallel story in a different gospel that actually says there was two people there. Um, and so one of them went to Jesus and the other one didn't. And so there it's, it's possible for a demonized person. If the demons are fully controlling that person, they don't want to go get set free at all. Um, and so they can completely just run in the other direction. Um, and, and I would think that that would be the, what they would prefer to do. Um, you know, and then, so then the other example is the physical manifestation of the boy that would convulse and be thrown in the fire. Um, yeah, it's, you know, they, they definitely had a position of strength in that boy. Um, you know, Jesus even says this kind comes out, but by prayer and fasting. And so there is a deeper level of faith, a deeper level of commitment and involvement required there that Jesus is telling us about. But it's really, um, it, I don't know that the fact that they had a physical um access to his body that was the reason it was tougher um i'm not sure you know i would say really anytime demons are speaking through a person that's a physical manifestation right and so you have the other accounts when jesus is talking to someone who's demonized that's a, technically a physical manifestation, as well as um, when when the disciples go out, Jesus and go out, sends them out in twos, and they're going town to town, and they come back and they say, "Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name." That implies that they were also getting physical manifestations and speaking to demons in this very deliberate kind of way, right? It's not, uh, it's not like they were just walking up and praying for people, be healed, be healed, be healed. They says, the, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name, right? So that, that active submission suggests that there was some sort of interrogation happening. And so I think that, uh, I mean, it's possible that 
you know, by having both the emotions and the body that there could be a greater level of entanglement and maybe uh, more that's needed in order to have that freedom. But, um, but I don't know that I, I don't know that I would assume that that's always the case. All right. Hopefully that is helpful. Um, so, yep, I see, I see one other question, um, but definitely need some more. So, so add some more in, add some more in. All right. So, the next question is from Kate, and she asks, how can you self-assess your own soul to stay free? Okay, and then, um, okay, so how can you self-assess your own soul to stay free? Well, one of the things that I do in the Empowered Christian Roadmap is I have an assessment at the end, a personal assessment at the end of every chapter. And since each chapter focuses on a key principle of the Christian faith, it's a way of evaluating your, to, so you're giving yourself a personal assessment of your own um beliefs, behaviors, lifestyle, and so on. And so there's this each each one of these principles. So like the first the first chapter is about just having the right roadmap, which is about right beliefs. Um, the same thing with the second chapter, it's about the right beliefs when it comes to soteriology or the the doctrine of salvation. And so it's just making sure you have right beliefs, right understanding, right faith, right trust. And so by examining your own beliefs, your own um, doctrine that you hold to, that's, that's an important first place to, to assess your own uh, freedom. Because Jesus said, if you do what I tell you to do, then you'll be my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if we want freedom, we first need truth, and we need to actually be uh, following and being – we need to trust Jesus, and we need to be obedient to what he has commanded us. And then that will uh, align our beliefs and lifestyle with the truth and then that will set us free. And so beliefs are very, very important. Doctrine's important. A huge part of spiritual warfare, of deliverance, of inner healing is learning right beliefs. And so that, you know, I'm always encouraging clients, continue to grow, continue to learn, read books. And don't just read the, you know, the latest, greatest book by some prophet or something, even the old Christian classics, you know, the, the, the stuff that is with, with hell, with held with, what is this word I'm trying to say? <laughs> it's, they've withstood the test of time, the stuff that's been around for decades or hundreds of years, the, you know, it, it especially the word of God, like that is the foundation of truth. And then the other books are ways that help unpack the word of God. And so even, you know, other things like um, Bible study and um, commentaries, biblical commentaries, these are ways to assess what we believe. Um, and then I would also assess your thought patterns, so it's, it's, it's about what you believe, but it's also about what you think. What do you think on a regular basis? The greater level of thoughts that, are, that don't align up with God's truth, with what he's doing in the world, with the truth of the gospel, with what he has for your life, that is an area where there may not be freedom. And so you have to continue to press into that. As people get more and more free, they tend to have more and more of their thought life back as well. The next area would be the emotional area, right? What emotions are you feeling? Um, in 
Galatians 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And I actually was talking about this in the Empower Hour as well. Like, the fruit of the Spirit is the natural attributes and characteristics of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. These are attributes of God. And so the more of you that the Holy Spirit has, the more of these attributes or fruits of his presence will be evident in your life so are you feeling those emotions right are you feeling the in your emotional states on a regular basis that's not to say you need to be perfect and never struggle with anything but is it more and more evident in your life right so this is galatians 5 still in the esv it says the fruit of the spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So is that evident in your emotional state on an ongoing basis? If it is, that's excellent. Continue to pursue these things. If it's not, then that's an area that could be, could be under some type of demonic bondage could also be just aspects of the sinful flesh that need to be crucified. So even right above this, where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he talks about the the sinful desires of the flesh. He doesn't say that this is all the stuff you'll do if you've got a bunch of demons. Because this is our our, you know, one of our greatest enemies is our own sin nature. So some of this stuff is coming from us. And even sometimes when demons are there, they are sort of provoking the sinful part of us to go along with their agenda because they're also sinful. They want us to be in sin. They're also in sin, right? And it says, now the works of the flesh, this is verse 19. So this is not demons. This is the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. All right. So this is the other areas of of the sinful flesh. And so if you're when you're assessing your own uh, how much freedom you're walking in, you want to continue to grow in the fruit of the Spirit, continue to surrender, becoming more and more like Christ, which will make these things um, natural outworking of him in your life. You won't be like, I have to choose to be kind. I have to choose to be good and gentle and be controlled. Now, it may, it may feel that way sometimes, and, and, you should, and you should do it, but really it's more about you. we want to strive to get to that place where some of the – where these things are just the natural, it's just the way that we are. Like, I just, I just am joyful now. I just am loving. I just am patient. I don't have to try to do it so much. I might ha- occasionally have to try to, you know, or I may seek to be more of it, but we should see that growth there. We should see that freedom there. And so, yeah, so control the beliefs, the thoughts, the emotions, and then the natural outworking of all of this in your day-to-day life. In chapter 5 of um, the Empowered Christian Roadmap talks about like living a life of fruitfulness. So it's not enough to just have right beliefs, right thoughts, right emotions. It's how, how does this live out in your life, right? Because if you, if you can feel great and think all the right stuff, but Satan can keep you in your house and you never – take it out and bear good fruit in the world with it, then you're still in bondage in some way. Um, You know, either demonic bondage or you're in, in bondage to your own selfish sin nature that says it's, it's about my life and I get to do whatever I want that makes me happy. And so I don't have to worry about other people and I don't have to worry about glorifying God and what he wants me to be doing, which would actually be, um, you know, idolatry and, and some of these other things we looked at. All right. So, let's see. We've got another question. Let's see. Do most demonized people 
have a spirit spouse, or at least the ones that have strong physical manifestations where their body moves. Okay. Um, and there's more of a question. Okay, that's the second question. All right. So the first one, do most demonized people have a spirit spouse? Uh, I would say no, I don't think so. Um, the, the idea of a spirit spouse is when there's a, there's a need being met in our soul where we want to be connected. We, we want to have love. We want to have affection. We want, um, to feel wanted. We want to feel significant. And this, this demonic presence comes in and attempts to fill that need. And it, and it creates a type of partnership. It, it says, I'm, I, you know, for basically it's, I'll, I'll be your spouse. I will connect with you and I will satisfy you in some way, um, in a way that you're partially in agreement with, right? If, if you are in disagreement with the whole thing, it's not really a spouse. It's, it would just be some form of, you know, uh, you know, it, it would, it would be more like a, like sexual or physical or emotional abuse where you're just being attacked or like rape or something like that where you're just being attacked against your will the spiritual spouse arrangement is it's it's meeting a need on some deep level that you've you've allowed it to meet and so the the reason why that's so powerful is because there's an emotional connection there this is why a lot of times people will have, you know, when they're kids, they'll have like an imaginary friend and those things turn out to be some kind of spirit spouse later on. Or they were, you know, they they were married and then their spouse of a lot of years like died and then there were this grieving widow and they were looking for this need, this void to be filled and then the spirit can kind of move in. It's It's one of the reasons why we really need to to have ourselves yoked to the Lord first, where he is where we get our needs met, where he is where we're putting our trust, where he is where we get our ultimate love and significance and value and identity, because then we're not leaving this void because it's essentially it's a form of idolatry, right? We are, God is not, God says, we are to love him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength, right? And so if we're doing that, there is no, there's no space left for a spiritual spouse. Um, and so, yeah, and, and it's possible that uh, physical manifestations um, could play a role in that, um, but... A lot of times the spiritual spouse will actually be connected to more of like an incubus succubus type of relationship where if it's physical, there's sometimes a sexual component to what the demon is doing, or people will feel like it's laying in the bed next to them. Like, so it's, it's relational in that sense. It's, it's there, it, you know, and, and I've, I've even encountered really, disturb people online who ask me like how do i invite an incubus or a succubus because they want to have sex with it and that's super creepy but for people who are just being led by lust and perversion and they don't they're just trying to get pleasure and they don't care and they don't realize once you've invited this thing in it's gonna it might stay and keep having sex with you even when you don't want to essentially raping you and so you can't open that door. And so that's, that's why the, the spiritual spouse is, it's most people, I wouldn't say most people with demons have them um, because not everybody has that deep need and is letting a demon meet it on that spiritual level, on that deep emotional level. Um, and so, yeah. All right, here's another question. Can you explain 
how we can put on the helmet of salvation. How does this relate to renewing the mind? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So for those of you who are not familiar with this expression, this comes from Ephesians chapter 6. where Paul is describing how to put on the armor of God. And he, he sort of uses this, the armor of, of a person in military battle as a metaphor. And example includes the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, um, the shield of faith. And, and then he, in verse 17, Ephesians 6, verse 17, he says, take the helmet of salvation Right. And so the helmet of salvation. So how can we put on this? Let me actually take. Um, and so just to I'm just going to take a look at some different translations here. So interestingly enough, um, you phrase the question, how can we put on the helmet of salvation? But I'm looking at a bunch of different translations here, and the New Living Translation says, put on salvation as your helmet. And let's see. The Aramaic Bible in plain English says, put on the helmet of salvation. Um, but the vast majority of them do not say the word put on. So that's an interesting thing to think about um, as we're examining this. It's well, I saw one other one. Where did it go? Um, the contemporary English version. This is not going to be a very uh, literal interpretation, but it's, it might be interesting. It says, "Let's." It says, "Let God's saving power be like a helmet." That's interesting. Let God's saving power be like a helmet. So, but the vast majority, and I would say the ones that I would think are most literal and reliable, like, um, you know, the King James Bible, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard, they all say, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so, so how do we take the helmet of salvation? Well, the, let's think about what the helmet is, what it does. Why is Paul using it this way? He's saying the helmet, which is what's protecting your brain. <laughs> it's protecting the most sensitive part of your body and you know, because you could get hit somewhere in the chest and still maybe survive. But you, you take a deadly wound right to the skull, that's it, right? And so he says that thing, it's protecting you. It's guarding you. It's keeping you safe. You've got this shield of faith that you're holding up from um, verse 16. But this protects your mind and your head even if something gets past your shield of faith. And so he's saying you should have faith, you should believe all of this other important stuff, right? We, we know that there's a lot of things that we have faith in that we trust God for. But what's the most important one? What's the thing that actually guards the most, um, the most, uh, you know, vulnerable part of our body? And that's our mind. And that's, salvation itself salvation itself and so how do we put it on or how do we take this helmet i think we need to know how we're saved i think we need to know how we're saved and by continuing to have trust in that knowledge in that faith in that then that will allow us to protect our mind 
it will allow us to protect our mind, right? Because Satan may get one of these flaming arrows and pierce, let's say, even part of your heart or part of your chest, right? Which, you know, and the heart is kind of described usually metaphorically to be like where the emotions are, like it's from the heart. But let's just say he pierces your emotions and you feel um, – Let's say you feel something like I I doubt my own salvation, and I I am I'm feeling depression, I'm feeling anxiety, I'm feeling stress, I'm feeling um, not confident. Whatever the case may be, I feel like God doesn't love me. I feel like He's far away right now, and these are all emotional states, and sometimes the emotions are very powerful. But as Christians, we don't allow our emotions to dictate what we believe and what we will trust and what we will do. Like I can feel anxious about something and then my mind can tell my body, don't give into that. Don't give into that feeling. I could feel depressed and low and have, have, uh, this was a, you know, and I can, I can have this low energy, this, this weight on my shoulders, if you will. And then my mind can say, don't, don't go along with that. Right. So the motions, they, they're powerful, but they don't, they're not always reliable. They're not always reliable. We talk about this in chapter, uh, four, where we actually have to control our thoughts so that our thoughts can influence our emotions. And so sometimes we feel the emotion first. This is actually part of the way the human uh, body was created. If you, There's a book many years ago called Emotional Intelligence, and it describes how we can be more emotionally intelligent. And it actually describes how um, when stimulus happens in the body, it like they actually can like in a lab they can see this like it goes past a part of the brain um called the amygdala which is the area of the brain that triggers the fight or flight response and then it goes i might be confusing the technical language but i think it goes to the neocortex or something and which is the part of the brain that processes logic and reasoning so li- like literally it goes to the part of your body where you feel emotional, you know, you feel the emotions first, and then it goes to the part of your brain that actually decides if you're supposed to, if you should. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So it's like you're, you're having to then, like you might feel, I don't know, let's say you feel fear, and then it goes to your brain and you're brain says, yes, a lion is chasing you. You should feel fear. Run. (laughs) Um, Or you feel fear and then it goes to your brain and you're like, you're sitting on your couch watching TV. What on earth are you afraid of right now? (laughs) Like, and, but you're going to feel that fear either way. And so we have to learn, we have to make the feelings, the emotions submit to something higher than them. And ultimately I believe the thing that gives us the ability to do that is our brain, our mind. And so this is why in the fruit of the spirit that we looked at before, the last one is self-control. And if we have self-control, then our mind, our brain could say, no, here's what's really going on. Here's what's true. Here's what's accurate. Emotions, you need to get on board with this plan. And so in the most important thing we could guard ourselves with is the knowledge of our own salvation that no matter what happens in this life we have eternal life as long as we continue to trust in god and so that's a safeguard that protects us from so many things what happens when you lose your family in a car crash you need your brain to tell your emotions as bad as this is right now we are still going to have eternal life there will be a time in the future when you will not feel the pain that you currently feel There will, you know, when persecution is after you, when people are trying to kill you and you have to flee your country, you know, a lot of, 
around, you know, I'm doing this prosperity gospel conference later tonight and it's broadcast throughout the 1040 window in the Middle East where a lot of people are being persecuted and they're, they need to, you need to know, like when you're on the run, look there, it's okay to feel some fear if you're literally people are trying to kill you. Um, you know, you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. You don't know where you're going to live tomorrow. But you, we need our brain to guard that and say, despite all that, God has you. God has you. There's a plan for all this. There's a purpose to it. There's a long-term destination that that all this will be worked out and it's going to bless and help point you to and help get you to that that other place later on. And so the helmet of salvation guards us from all of the other stuff that we're going to go through. And, and that, and you ask kind of a follow-up question of how does this relate to renewing the mind? And it's just that the more you meditate and know and understand and then trust in God's promises and what the truth of everything is, then you can, um, it's you renew your mind because there's only so many times when you need to feel this emotion and you have to remind yourself, hey, don't feel that way anymore. After a long time of doing this, it's going to become second nature where you just know I'm, I shouldn't feel that. I should not feel that. It's not trustworthy. Um, it comes from the enemy or it comes from my sinful flesh or it comes from the situation happening in the world. But I don't need to go along with that. Because no matter what happens, God has me. And I think, uh, and no matter what happens, my eternal, my eternal life, where I'm going for eternity, and, and I know that there will be eternal life with, with no sadness or sorrow or pain or death or mourning, none of that will happen in the life to come after the resurrection. And so that can help sustain us through whatever else comes in this life. All right, so let's see. All right, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful. Um, so next question. Since demons tend to attach to emotional wounds, do you believe that when Jesus went around casting out demons, he was also healing people emotionally? Thank you for answering my questions. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, since demons tend to attach to emotional wounds, do you believe Jesus went around casting out demons? He was also healing people emotionally. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, there, it, it was actually, uh, interesting in the conference we did on Tuesday night, which will be, um, it, it will be added to the empowered interviews course playlist. And so, um, it's not up there yet. It will probably be added tomorrow. And so you guys can check that out. Um, and then, uh, I'll probably do the one tonight probably get that in there as well and and that was all about the topic of healing and even though i'm at least one or two of the other guys is a cessationist meaning they don't think god heals the same way through people anymore um and i'm you know and as an exorcist and deliverance minister i'm you know i'm talking to these these guys who are like scholars and and I don't know how much they're on like the ground level dealing with people's issues, like the way, the way that I do. And so, um, and I'm sure I don't even know where they stand on demons and deliverance. That's usually a taboo topic in a lot of Christian circles, but the Holy, at some point, the Holy spirit <laughs> laid it on my heart towards the end of, of the night. And I just said, even though God doesn't always heal. Um, but I believe you know, that demons are in the world and that they're afflicting people and they cause physical illness as 
Um, I didn't say this, but I would, and I'll add, they also cause emotional illness and mental illness as well. And when demons get removed, they, right, the, the problem, a lot of, the, it's possible that they could cause a problem or exacerbate a current problem in a person's life. Um, and there's still some part of that behind. But a lot of the time, in fact, the, I would say probably the majority of the time that just had a personal experience, when the demon causing the problem is cast out, the problem goes with it that they were causing, especially if it was like, if it was like the demon had to actively cause this problem in order for it to be a problem. Um, and yeah, I told, <laughs> and so I'm telling these scholar types. Yeah. And so, and I believe every Christian has the ability to cast out demons in Jesus name. He gave us that power and authority. And so, yeah, I think when we, if you, if you study the scriptures carefully, the vast majority of the times it's when it says all the sick people, all the people who were ill came to Jesus and it says Jesus has Jesus and his, the apostles and the disciples. It says when they casted out the demons and healed their diseases. And so I think these things are, they're not two separate events. Like, Hey, let me cast out your demons and also let me bring the healing. I think a lot of time the problem that they're suffering that they need healing for was actually being caused by something demonic. In fact, some of these people may not have come to Jesus or the apostles knowing that they had demons. They might have just thought they had physical infirmity or mental illness or emotional problems. And then Jesus heals that. And it just so happens he does it by removing the demon connected to it. And so, yeah, I think it's very much, um, connected to probably have enough time for one more question if somebody wants to ask another one um so yeah but i think that there is a a, a connection between demons and emotional wounds um that he was bringing healing to and i think uh, some an example of this is people are often filled with joy afterwards they're filled with peace afterwards they have they have contentment and and they you know even if just looking at the fruit of the spirit right love joy peace i mean you have peace you have joy you have patience you have kindness you have goodness you have gentleness right these are you have self-control these are usually a lot of these are emotions and so if that is the evidence of the holy spirit there then he then god is bringing emotional healing to the whole person as well as removing the demon that was trying to interfere with our emotional state uh, being aligned up with God's will. Um, all right. So I see a comment here. I'm not sure if that's a question. <laughs> so I see another question from... Uh, Hate saying the Greek word soho is saved and healed. I'm not, is that a question? <laughs> okay, just a comment. All right. So, do I have a recommended reading list? Um, yes, I do. In fact, let me let me tell you what the link is. I actually have a public version of it. I don't have a ton of um, I don't have a ton of books recommended on here yet, but if more and more people want to know, I will, I will do more. Um, and so, um, let's see. You can go to, I'll just tell you how to get there. Go to empoweredchristian.org, and then underneath the button Learn, scroll down, and it says Become a Better Disciple. And then within that drop-down, the 
fourth one down is a link to a recommended reading list. And so um, I, know, I have a few books in there. I have, I have The Empire Christian Roadmap. Uh, I'm biased, but I'm including that one. <laughs> um, but I also include Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. It was a really great book. Um, kind of an introduction to Christian apologetics and Christian philosophy. And he gets into, he's just a great writer. He's, um, I think this was, it was a compilation of uh, messages he did back in, in the 1940s and 50s, I believe. And they put it together in his book. And it's been, it's been a classic for 70 years. Um, I also include the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey, which is not a Christian uh, book. It's act he's actually a Mormon, but I read that one very early on in my twenties. And he, so he talks about Jesus. He has a little bit of a different idea of who Jesus is, but it did help plant the seed that faith is important, um, which was an important part of my journey. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that aspect of it, but the principles that he covers, these habits are very effective, um, <laughs> for lack of better words. They're, they are good principles that are godly and biblical and true that we should base our life on. And, and he covers a lot of different ways of thinking about them, of how to practically live our life. And so it's a good like life coaching type of a book. Um, and then if you start to interweave some of the biblical understanding, some of the Christian understanding, um, and sort of incorporate those together. I think it's a helpful manual for living a productive, fruitful life. Um, I also include uh, Norman Geisler and Frank Turek's book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Um, that's a great book. It walks you through 12 steps from how do we know that there's a God at all to then how do we know that God is personal to then how do we know that that's the God of the Bible to then how do we know that there, Jesus was real? How do we know that the Bible is reliable? And it kind of each step is like linear and chronological. And so it takes you through a bunch. I include um, a couple of spiritual warfare books. Um, I recommend Demon Proofing Prayers and Curse Breaking and Jezebel by Bob Larson, who is my mentor who helped train me in some of these areas of spiritual warfare ministry and deliverance and um you know, so that's some great content in there. Um, I also recommend They Shall Expel Demons by Derek Prince, which is another uh, book that walks you through that this is genuinely a Christian calling, um, that, that, that we should all be walking in to some degree. You should know how to cast out demons. You should know how to, um, you should know how to discover their evidence in your life or in other people's lives. And so, you know, you guys who have who have some knowledge and experience in this now that there are other people who don't know these things. And so it's it's a good area of ministry to learn more about them and to help teach this stuff to other people. Um, I have a section on purpose and calling, including a bo the book More um, Purpose Driven Life, Shape. Um, I have some other apologetics books, The Case for Christ, um, The Case for, uh, let's see, oh, I don't see it in here. Um, oh, there it is, uh, The Case for a Creator, which I read when I was 25, which is scientific evidence that points to God, um, Big Book of Christian Apologetics by Norm Geisler, uh, On Guard by William Lane Craig, Cold Case Christianity um, is a really cool book by J. Warner Wallace. And I have some end times books in here. Uh, Dennis Prager, he's actually Jewish, but his book is about um, it's about these competing ideologies for how to control or how to run the world. And he he shows like an American way of um, having government and why that's the best out of the only three other out of the three options. The other one is an Islamic one. And the other one is like a leftist atheist based one that is has vague morality and um, and so that's a powerful thing. I think we can learn a lot of principles about um, from that book. And then I, I include Joel Richardson's book, um, The Islamic Antichrist and Mystery Babylon, and uh, Samuel Waldron's book, End Times Made Simple. And some of these things are covered a little bit 
in the Empire Christian Roadmap and in the Truth About the Rapture and the Tribulation course. Um, but it's a good way to just familiarize yourself with the end times. You won't. It'll give you a way to know what's coming and and be able to see it and to prepare yourself mentally and emotionally for it. Um, I also include some other things like some Bibles. Um, if you just want like a good, uh, just like a um, a life story kind of a book, um, Infidel by Ayan Hirsi Ali and Hiding in the Light by Rifka Berry. Those are really cool. Same with uh, um, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nabil Qureshi. Um, all those are in the general section. Those are really cool books about their personal life and what God did through them. It's their own testimony. Um, you know, in Nabil Qureshi, we actually talked about him. One of the guys I was on with on Tuesday knew him personally. And um, so, yeah, their their stories are really cool and, and you can learn a lot from them. Plus, they're inspirational and you see how God works with people coming from different from different cultures, different backgrounds. Uh, all three of them came from Islamic backgrounds and, were, and then ultimately found the Lord. I have a marriage relationship um, resources in here, His Needs, Her Needs, Love Busters, Gary Thomas's Sacred Marriage. These are great books if you're married um, or looking to get married because they can prepare you with how you should think about relationships now in preparation for marriage one day. Or if you're currently married, there are ways to either fix current problems in the marriage or even just to invest time proactively and try to um, – prevent problems from happening later on in the future. Like we, that's, we really, that's one of the principles in the seven habits is be more proactive, like anticipate that problems will happen later if we don't get things in order now and start to take steps today so that you don't have problems later. It's way easier to fix a little small thing that might become a problem and just grow it and have blessing rather than to wait until it's broken and now you're trying to fix and repair it when it's barely hanging on together. Um, and then I have a couple of um, productivity books. I have Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, I have Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, and uh, Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman. These are just so it's about productivity. But I think, you know, we're called to be stewards, right? We have to steward our time, our money, our talent, our spiritual gifts, our opportunities, everything that we have, we want to learn to steward for God's glory. And we don't have to, you know, the Bible isn't the only way, the, the only resource that we have. Any good idea that is compatible and consistent with biblical principles, we can learn from, we can grow from. And so you don't have to limit yourself to only Christian books. Become knowledgeable about your faith, grow in your relationship with the Lord, and that will help protect you from non-Christian or unbiblical bad ideas from other sources. Like I can learn content from any source. Um, now, I mean, some I know are like toxic, like I'm not going to go through people who are known occultists and, and you know, that kind of thing, because I know there's way too much of the well. I'm not going to dig around through 90% garbage to try to find the 10% good. <laughs> but you can go through secular content that's just not religious in nature and gain good information and then balance that out and throw away anything that may be unbiblical or, or not part of God's will for your life. Um, and But you might find principles and habits and techniques and ideas that, that are valuable and embrace them. So I will um, – yeah, so that's a few things I have in there. And uh, if you guys want more, I will come up with more. I am – I don't recommend a lot of books just because, you know, once you kind of put your name to it, it's it, it doesn't mean I agree with every single thing in the book. Um, and, and I probably don't agree with everything in any of these books either. Um, but for the most part – they're pretty good and they're pretty I, I would recommend them and say i agree with 95 percent of what's in here and they're generally good good resources to use for the purpose with which they were intended to be used for um all right so i will um 
let's see, we're about out of time, but I see one quick question here. Do you plan on doing any deliverance sessions in an online group? Um, I have a few different ways that I want to incorporate this. We're going to have virtual small groups. And so if you go and look at the level four mobilization level of Empower 365, I'll have the option where you can host your own small group related to any topic that your heart desires. One of those could be a deliverance related group where people are specifically going for prayer for deliverance um, or to pray for other people who need deliverance. So, you know, let's say you start with five people, three of them need deliverance. You're all praying for one another, helping one another. You get to the place where everybody's good. And then you can start another, you know, a semester later, wait a couple of months, start inviting new people in so that a few of the other people can pray for those people and so forth. Um, yeah, and I'm, th that's probably a great outlet for it. I am, I am open to the idea of a using the Freedom Friday as an opportunity for me and multiple people to pray for healing and deliverance for somebody. I'm open to that. Um, we would have to, you know, there's other issues like, um, I want these to be able to go in the archives. So people have to be, you know, willing to let any manifestations or something happen, you know, cause they'll be on camera and, um, you know, so that's, that's a consideration. And then there's also, I think the people praying for them, uh, would also need to, you know, they would, they're either going to be on camera as well, or maybe everybody could be in the background. We'll just turn on the audio so people can pray uh, out loud, even though they're, you know, they're, they're not on camera, but their voice would still be able to be heard by the other person. Um, I'm okay with that option. I think, I think there's a place for that. I don't want this to turn into a thing we're always doing deliverance on. I want that um, but I think, uh, you know, people who still struggle with demons can definitely come learn and grow. And if one of the questions is, Hey, I'm struggling with this. Can you guys all pray for me? Um, give some specifics. And then I think having multiple people, people included in that prayer, I think that could be a blessing. I think that could be a benefit for them. So, um, all right, well, so that is freedom Friday episode number one. So I'm glad to have you guys join me um, for everyone who was able to come. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your questions. I hope these were, answers were helpful and beneficial. And uh, I invite all you guys who are watching this later on, get into the future live streams. Let's, let's grow this thing. Let's, let's um, make this an area of community um, where you guys can, can reach and, and connect with one another. And uh, I think it'll be I think it'll be a wonderful way to to help educate the body of Christ, to help grow the members here. And um, and you guys can pray and support one another. Um, I don't know if you guys can all see each other in the chat. So if you can, then you'll know how many people were actually here today. <laughs> but you can you know, you have each other's names if you're able to see it and you can, you know, Say, I don't know what this person is dealing with, but I'm going to start praying for them. It's they, they have some interest in spiritual warfare and deliverance. And so we can all use a blessing and prayer for that. So, all right. Well, until next week, um, if you're able to go check out the conference that it's on tonight at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time at the Trinity Channel.com. It's about can Christians speak things into existence? It's, we're going to get into decreeing and declaring. And all this kind of stuff is going to be awesome. So until next week, I'll see you guys. Have a blessed rest of your week. Go and have an empowered week. God bless.